What we, what we learned last day was that simple harmonic motion only depended on two things. It always depended on a restoring force. When something got away from equilibrium, there was some force that says, come back, come back, come back. And we, we characterize that uh, uh, restoring force by the stiffness of a spring, the spring constant. How many newtons you have to pull to stretch that spring by one unit, typically a meter. Now, the other thing that it depends on is the inertia. How hard it is to get that object back to equilibrium. You know, if it's a big, massive object, it's hard to speed it up and slow it down uh, to get it back to equilibrium. And so that changes the timing in the system. The key is that it was independent of the amplitude. Now, what we found was that the period of the oscillation depended on the mass and the spring constant in this relationship here. And we could put it upside down, and that became the frequency, because frequency was 1 over the period. And those formulas will be on the front page of the exam. Now, when we're trying to find a spring constant, that gives us two ways to go about it. The first way, the 205 method, is called the static method. And that method just has you take the spring out of the box from the factory, hang the block on it of mass m, and see how much the spring stretches. And then we use Hooke's law. And you notice that I left the minus sign out just to avoid confusion. Uh, we're typically just dealing with magnitudes here. We know that if the stretch is down, the force is up. And so there's more, supposed to be a minus sign here. We, we neglect that, typically. Now, um, the other method, called the dynamic method, has us bounce that mass up and down on the spring and use this formula. If we know the timing, the period of one oscillation, and we know the mass that's going up and down, we can solve this formula for k. We solve that formula by squaring both sides. And we get the k out of the basement by cross multiplying. And we get that formula there. Now in some of the homework problems that you had for today, you use this method to find k. And in other problems, you used this method to find k. Now, um, last day, we, uh, we did the oscillation of one half kilogram on a spring, and we found that it had a period of about, was it 0.72 seconds? And we got a spring constant that was, uh, I did it after class, and it turned out to be 51, or, and in the static case, we got 41 newtons for each meter. And I think the bottom line is that um, either Tori didn't time right or I didn't say start and stop right. That's probably so I think if we have to choose yeah. where to lay the blame, <laughs> Just for you. it's here. Okay? So, but, but had we done that with great precision, we would have gotten the same answer with either method. Okay. Let's uh, look at this problem here. You've got a two kilogram block. It's hanging from a spring and oscillating up and down with a period of one second. We want to use the same spring, but we're going to grab a different block. What mass should the block have if I want to double the period? Now, I want to, do I want a bigger block or a smaller block to double the period? Smaller. Am I making, making it go faster or slower? Slower. So I want a bigger block. And I want to double that period. Now, in order to double that period, I've got to double what's on the right-hand side. 
But I can't mess with that. That's just, that's pi. That's 3.14. I mean, the Kansas State Legislature changed it to 3, but I don't think we can. <laughs> They're clever people. Uh, so K, can I change K? No, it's the same spring. Once that spring is made at the factory, it has a certain K value. That's a characteristic of the spring. We can't change that. And so all we can do is change this mass. Now, if we double that mass, is that going to double the right-hand side of the equation? No. no, because it's under the square root. So we have to multiply that mass by a, a factor of 4. The square root of 4 is 2. That will make the right-hand side double, and that makes the left-hand side double. Double. So instead of a 2 kilogram block, we would have to use an 8 kilogram block. Okay, see if your neighbor followed that proportional reasoning. of mass on a spring problem. The easiest flavor, uh, by far, is the horizontal case. And remember last day I told you, I promised you, we would always use a frictionless surface. This is the easiest case because the weight of the block is always being canceled by the uh, table pushing up with a normal force. And so that means that when I look at Newton's second law, F net equals MA. Remember, that's the one great equation of, of 205. That's the, the one equation to bring them all and in the darkness bind them. Uh, we all had that tattooed onto us, right? Okay. Now, in this case, if the weight force is balanced by the normal force up by the table, the net force is just the pull by the spring. Okay? And so I could rewrite this as the force by the spring is equal to MA. Okay, in the horizontal case. Now, if that spring, when it came from the factory, is exactly that long, if I attach this block to the spring and just set the block there, it's going to stay there because the spring is neither stretched nor compressed. And we call that equilibrium. The furthest distance we get away from equilibrium, the turnaround point, we call the amplitude. Okay, and so if I were to pull this block out this distance A and let go, this thing would go boing, 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 boing forever if we had a frictionless surface. It had never, never stopped. And it would be going, not at all here, it has to stop to turn around. It would be going fastest there. The net force is equal to zero when the spring is neither stretched nor compressed. And that's where the acceleration would also be zero. If I look at this turnaround point here and draw a free body diagram for the block, I've got the weight down, I've got the normal by the table up, they cancel and I have the spring pushing. Now if I look at Hooke's law, I know how hard the spring is pushing. It's pushing with an amount K delta S. But at that turnaround, The delta S is equal to plus or minus S. Whoa, I did not say that. And if you say that I said that, I will deny it. Who are people going to believe? You or me? It's plus or minus the capital A. Okay? Now, that means that the magnitude of the force, always a positive quantity, is going to be Ka. And it's going to be pointing back towards the equilibrium position. Now if I do the same thing over here, 
I'm going to get the same free body diagram, but the force by the spring will be pointing the opposite way. Okay, so what we find is that the acceleration is zero at the location where the block is moving the fastest. And the acceleration is maximum at the place where the block is not moving at all. And that's the answer to that first problem that you solved for today's homework that we did not turn in. Check to see if your neighbor got that right. Okay, do a buddy check. Why not? Okay. Now, the more the more difficult case, the messier case, is the case where you hang a spring from a support and then you attach the mass to the spring, that causes the spring to stretch until the pull by the spring can balance the weight of the block. And at that location it would just stay and not move. We call that the new equilibrium point. Okay? Now if I pull that down an extra distance A and then let go, this block is going to bounce above and below the equilibrium point the same amount. So I'm going to have capital A below that equilibrium and capital A above that equilibrium. Now if I look at my, my free body diagrams, my net force is zero at the equilibrium. There's no acceleration. And that's because at that point, the weight of the block is balanced by the stretch of the spring. Now, if I look at one of the turnaround points, for example up there, the weight's still the same. You can't change that except through diet or exercise. But now, the spring is not stretched as much. And so I have a spring force less than the weight. And that gives me a net force down. Now it turns out, we can show mathematically, I'm not going to take the time to do it here, but that net force is going to be equal to Ka, where A is the distance from the equilibrium point to the turnaround point. So it would be this distance here. Just like in the horizontal case. Now, the same thing is true at this turnaround point. The weight's the same, but now the stretch of the spring is giving a spring force much greater than the weight, giving me a net force up, this would also be equal to Ka, where the A is this distance there. Okay. Now, I want you to realize that throughout this whole process, we're always just using that F net equals MA over and over and over again. Okay? Um, it's just complicated by the fact that in this problem, the F net is not just the spring force. In this problem, uh, the weight is not canceled by the table pushing up. Now, because that brings in an extra complication, I'm going to make you a promise right here now. Okay? You ready for it? On the exam, on the problems where you're going to have to worry about how fast this thing's going when it's two centimeters away from equilibrium, I'm always going to do that on a horizontal surface, never on a vertical problem. Okay, that's my promise to you. It's just so much cleaner that way. Now you can show mathematically, I'm not going to go through the time, take the time to do it, but you can show that if I'm going up and down, up and down, four centimeters below, four centimeters above this equilibrium point, when you add up the stretch of the spring, and you add in, or subtract off, because they're in opposite directions, the weight of the block. <coughs> if this block is down here at two centimeters below equilibrium, 
the net force is going to be k times 2 centimeters, just like in the horizontal problem. It's always the, the distance from the new equilibrium that gives you the net force. Uh, if, you, if you consider um, this much stretch of the spring to be balanced by the weight, then it's the extra stretch of the spring that gives you the net. If you did not understand what I just said, take comfort in my promise that I gave you, that I would never give you this problem on an exam. Okay? See if your neighbor follow that. <laughs> One second, let's let it calm down. Okay, folks, we have a question on the floor. I was just wondering if S sub S is always. In other words, what's my delta S? Yeah, well, if you were to solve S sub S there, to get the term of your salvation. Uh, this F sub S, this is why it's complicated. This F sub S is going to be K times delta S, where delta S is a stretch of the spring from its factory length. Okay? Uh, the net force, if you take this minus that, that will be F delta S, where delta S is the distance away from equilibrium. So in this problem, there's two different delta S's depending on whether you're talking about the force by the spring or the net force. And that's why I avoid it on exams. Okay? Um, I wish there was a, a way of making that less confusing. Okay, let's do a thought experiment because we don't have the money to do it in real life. We have this spring of some unstretched length we attach a block of mass M to that spring, and it stretches down to this new equilibrium point. We then pull it down a distance capital A, the amplitude, and let that bounce, point, 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 uh, up and down about that equilibrium. It bounces with a period of 1.2 seconds. We then take this device to the moon, where the gravitational field strength is one-sixth as big as it is on Earth, and we ask ourselves, what stays the same and what changes? First of all, let's talk about the unstretched length of the spring. Is that going to be the same or different on the moon? Same. same. You know, you're both right. It really depends on how closely you look at this problem. Typically, we ignore the mass of the spring relative to the heavy block. And in that case, taking it to the moon it's not going to stretch any less than it is on the Earth because we're neglecting the stretch due to its own weight. Okay? But if you had a real spring that had real significant mass, you know that by hanging it vertically, it's going to sag a little bit on its own weight. If I take it to the moon where it weighs one-sixth as much, it won't sag as much. So it will be a little bit shorter for a real spring with significant mass. We're always going to neglect the mass of the spring relative to the block. So we're going to say, in that approximation, the unstretched length stays the same. Now I put that same mass, I took the same mass from Earth, and attached it to the same spring. What can you tell me about D, the distance that it stretches down to its new equilibrium? It's going to be less, because the moon is pulling less. And so that's going to be shorter. What about this amplitude A? If it was 10 centimeters on the Earth, will it be 10 centimeters on the Moon, or more, or less? Okay, it could be. Trick question. It could be whatever I want it to be. <laughs> I can pull it down as much as I want. I can pull it down 10 again, or I can pull it down 5, or I can pull it down 16. And the funny thing is, the simple, in simple harmonic motion is, it just doesn't matter. It doesn't matter whether I pull it down 5 or 10 or 15 or 12. I always get the same oscillation. So I can make it the same. 
Now what about the frequency or the period of the oscillation? Are they going to change or stay the same? Let's look at our formula. Does the mass of the block change when I take it to the moon? No. no, the mass is how hard it is to shake it, to speed it up or slow it down. The weight changes on the moon, how heavy it feels. But if I shake it on the moon, it's just as hard on the moon as on Earth. The mass is constant. Likewise, the spring constant is determined at the factory. Once you make that spring, the spring constant has a value that doesn't change. And so taking it to the moon is not going to change that. So if I were using this device as the guts of a, of a clock, a cuckoo clock, it would keep the same time on the moon as it did on Earth. If it was running and keeping good time on Earth, it would run and keep good time on the moon. Okay? Little thought experiment. Okay. Let's solve this problem. We've got a two kilogram block. It's oscillating back and forth on a horizontal frictionless surface. Its period is one second, has an amplitude of 10 centimeters. Find the spring constant K. Now, just think about that for a moment. You have two different ways to find a spring constant, static and dynamic. Which method are you going to use here? Talk to your neighbor. You're going to use static or dynamic? Okay, which do you want to use, static or dynamic? Dynamic. We don't have enough information to do it, the static method, so we have to do it with the dynamic method. We start here, we solve for k and get here. This becomes 4, pi squared, remember, is 10. The mass here is 2, and that's going to be 4 times 10 is 40 times 2 is 80 newtons for each meter. Okay? Now, the second part of the problem asks us for the maximum acceleration of the block. The acceleration is always given by Newton's second law. Now, in a horizontal problem, the net force, because the weight is balanced by the table, the net force is just a spring. And the spring has a force by Hooke's law, K delta S. Now that formula there will give me the acceleration at any point in the motion. You tell me how much it, how far it is away from equilibrium, I'll tell you what the acceleration is. But in this case, we want the maximum acceleration. And if we want the maximum acceleration, what value must I have for delta F? Yeah, at maximum acceleration, we're at maximum stretch, we're at turnaround. And so in that case, my, my delta S is my amplitude. And so now, I can solve for my maximum acceleration. This we said was 80. This we said was 0.1. The mass was 2. 80 times 0.1 is 8. Divide that by 2 and you get 4. So we use this formula to find K and we got a value of 80. We use this formula to find A and we found a value of 4. See if your neighbor followed that please. Okay, let's, 
Let's pause for a moment and solve that problem that you voted off the island, number eight. In that problem, you had a spring of some unstretched length, and when you put a four kilogram block on it, it stretched a distance of 17 centimeters. And then, once you've got it there, you pulled it another 10 centimeters down and let it go. And they wanted to know what the uh, period was for oscillation, okay? So in other words, they wanted you to find, let me get a different color. They wanted you to find this. Well, you know that 2 is equal to 2 and pi is equal to 3.14. And you know that the mass in this case was 4. What you need is the spring constant. Now, in this case, you draw a free body diagram, you use the static approach. You have a weight force, if this is 4 kilograms, this would be 40 newtons. That means the force by the spring, if there's no acceleration, would be also 40 newtons. You use Hooke's law. What do you do for delta S? Do you use the 17 centimeters, or the 10 centimeters, or 27 centimeters? Is it? The amplitude is 10 centimeters. How does the how does the whole system depend on the amplitude? Not at all. So why did I give you that information? Why did I tell you that you pulled it down an extra 10 centimeters? To see if you would use that. Some of you are going to be doctors. Some of you are going to have to take the MCAT exam. And on that MCAT exam, they give you all sorts of information that you don't need. And that's the point of the, of the test, is to uh, see whether you can pick out those things that are important and ignore the stuff that is not. And so the amplitude is never, never important. You just ignore that and use the 17 centimeters here. I have to write it in meters. And that gives me a K value of 235 newtons for each meter. So I come in here and I put 235, and I can solve for that period. OK? Um, I got the same answer, but I said my formula mg equals kd. Uh, mg is equal to kd. D. Okay, and um, that's the same thing. I've got uh, um, oh right here. This was my mg. And this was my K delta S. You're just calling delta S V. Okay, I see it. So yeah, you got the same right. same thing I got. Other questions? Okay. Now, I'll remind you, back in 205, one of the more challenging sections was on energy. And it wasn't challenging because of the physics, it was challenging because the algebra got a little messy. Well, we're going to use those principles of energy, and with it is going to come that messy algebra. My apologies. You remember that we had some energy buckets. A kinetic energy bucket that was filled with this equation. A gravitational potential energy bucket that was filled with this equation. And a spring potential energy bucket that was filled with this equation. Now, we're going to always deal with an oscillating system that's going back and forth on a frictionless table. If I call, if I define the height of that table to be zero, I'm never going to have to worry about that gravitational energy. And so that means that the total energy is just going to be the kinetic energy of the block 
plus the potential energy of the spring. And if there's no friction, that total energy will stay the same. I never robbed. And so as this system goes back and forth, sometimes all the energy is in the block, and sometimes all the energy is in the spring. But the total stays the same. Now we can use that idea to solve a rich host of problems. In other words, I can give you the spring constant of this spring, and I can give you the amplitude of this oscillation, and I can ask you, when this spring is one centimeter from equilibrium, how fast is it going? Or when this block is going two meters per second, how far is it from equilibrium? Okay? Now, the way I do that is I always first find the total energy. Okay? At the turnaround point, I've got to stop to turn around. And so that means all the energy is in that uh, spring. So let's look at that. At turnaround, I've got to stop to turn around, and my delta S is going to be the biggest it ever gets, and that's going to be uh, plus or minus A. Let me write that again plus or minus A. If I look at this general formula, it becomes this. My V is zero, so I've got no kinetic energy. My delta S is going to either be A or minus A. I don't care which it is, because I'm squaring it. Okay? If I look at equilibrium, the spring there is neither stretched nor compressed. The delta S is zero. So at equilibrium, my delta S is zero, and that means that the velocity is going to be the fastest it's ever going to get. Okay? If I look at, this, at the block going this way, it's speeding up as the spring uh, pulls it, and then once it gets here, the spring is now compressing and it's slowing down. So it's going fastest right when it stops speeding up and starts slowing down. So that means the total energy is going to be one half mv max squared, and none of it's going to be in the potential energy bucket. That's really just one equation with two special cases. You know, what does that equation look like at equilibrium? What does it look like at the turnaround? If you're not at one of those two special places, you have to use the top equation. Okay? Now, the key is that the energy here has to equal the energy there, has to equal the energy there. It stays constant. So the first step in solving these problems, and you've got three of them for Wednesday, the first step is to find that total energy any way you can. Here's a sample. This is very similar to one of your three problems. A two kilogram block is at rest at the end of a horizontal spring. The spring constant is 100 meters per, uh, newtons per meter. The block is pulled out 20 centimeters and released. So what's the amplitude of this oscillation going to be? 20 centimeters, 0.2 meters. What is the maximum velocity of the resulting oscillations? Okay, and you have uh, these formulas. Now the first step is to find the total energy. Which of these equations do you want to use? The general equation, the turnaround equation, or the equilibrium equation? I know K, I know A, so I can use this version. And so that means that the E total is going to be 1 half times 100 times 0.2 squared, and that's going to be 2 joules. Now what they're asking for now is the maximum velocity. I know that in all of these equations, the E total has to be 2 joules. 
which of these equations is going to give me V max? That last one. Okay, so everyone should get this right because I just showed you how to do it. Use your clicker and tell me what V max is. It was a two kilogram block. Remember, K is equal to 100, M is equal to 2, and A is equal to 0. 0.5. Okay, the answer is A. Everyone choose A. Good enough. Good job. Okay, I'm rushing you because I need seven minutes to, to talk about the, the last topic. And uh, that's what I've got. These are the key ideas we've covered so far. The period only depends on the K value and the mass. The spring constant can be found two ways, the static and the dynamic way. The acceleration is always found through Newton's second law. And when we look for uh, the amplitude and the maximum velocity, we use the energy equation. Now, let's talk about one last thing. You're pushing your kid sister on a swing, and you know that there's just a certain frequency at which it's best to push if you want to get the amplitude as big as possible. If you push at any other frequency, sometimes you're going to be making her go higher and sometimes you're going to make her go uh, lower. But there's a certain frequency at which that swing wants to go back and forth. And it's related to the length of the swing. Likewise, every physical system has certain frequencies at which they want to oscillate. I used to have an old Chrysler Cordoba, 1979, and it had all sorts of different resonant frequencies, frequencies that wanted to oscillate. One of those happened to be the same frequency at which you hit the, the brakes in the road going to Belgrade if you were going at 60 miles an hour. And so if you went in that car at 60 miles an hour, by the time you got halfway to Belgrade, the car was shaken apart. The car couldn't go faster than 60, so we always had to go slower than 60. Now, you all, oh, here, let me give you an example, another example. This is a Tibetan prayer bowl. Close your eyes. As I put this stick around the outside, I'm creating what's called white noise. I'm, I'm creating vibrations at all different frequencies. There's one frequency at which this bowl wants to vibrate, in other words, sing. And that's the one that's amplified, that gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Okay. That was the spiritual part of the class. <laughs> okay. Now, this, this concept of resonance is responsible for the Tacoma Narrows bridge collapse. How many of you have seen this film before? Okay, I've got a short version, a very short version that has a very entertaining dialogue with it. I'm going to turn off the lights. You don't have to go to sleep. Okay. I had gone to watch the bridge. I drove onto the bridge and started crossing. In the car with me was my daughter's cocker spaniel, Tubby. Not until I reached the first tower did I realize that something was terribly wrong. Just as I drove past the towers, the bridge began to sway violently from side to side. The tilt from side to side became so violent that I lost control of the car. I jammed on the brakes and got out of the car, only to be thrown onto my face against the curb. Around me, I could hear concrete cracking. I started back to the car to get the dog, but I was thrown before I could reach it. 
The car itself began to slide from side to side on the roadway. I decided the bridge was breaking up. My only hope was to get back to shore. I crawled 500 yards or more to the towers. My knees were raw and bruised. My hands were swollen from gripping the concrete curb. But I was spurred on by the thought that if I could reach the towers, I would be safe. This is now an engineer observing it. I made an effort during a momentary decrease in the violence of the bridge motion to reach the car. But the car began to shift about in a most alarming manner. While I was out on this portion of the span, I took the opportunity to examine the state of the bridge. As far as the eye and ear could detect, the oscillations were causing no distress in the girder. Then, as I was sighting along the outside edge of the bridge, I saw a distinct break in the steel eye beam. From this point on, failure occurred so rapidly that observation was difficult and impression and fact were somewhat mixed. A whole section fell out of the bridge. After this first section fell, the whole bridge, almost at once, ceased its violent twisting motion and fell into a much easier vertical motion. The failure became progressive along the main span, the shock of each successive unloading of the main span producing a corresponding shock in the side span from which I was attempting to make observations. Two of these shocks were of sufficient force as to throw me violently to the deck. Those who stood on the shore and watched the bridge in its death agony still can have no conception of the violence of movement felt by one out beyond the towers. Safely back at the toll plaza, I saw the bridge in its final collapse and saw my car plunge into the narrows. With real tragedy, disaster, and blasted dreams all around me, I believe that right at this minute what appalls me most is that within a few hours I must tell my daughter that her dog is dead, but I might have saved him. Okay, have a good day weekend. We'll see you on Wednesday.